Okay, so our second and final event of this session is a panel discussion. It is about licensing our code for better impact and it is going to be hosted by Bob Turner. So please take it away. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, yep, as uh, that, that's the the, t the title of this session, so or this event. So what we're going to do is uh, first of all thank you uh, to the organisers for for having us. Thanks you all for coming along, um, and uh, thanks for the advice. I got quite a lot of input on the RSE Slack channel on sort of what should go into this. So thanks if you contributed to that. Um, and thanks in advance to the panel, who I will uh, give a chance to introduce themselves. Um, I think first I should say that we're going to get into some like legal stuff here. Um, this isn't legal advice. I can't advise on the law. This is this is kind of my understanding of, of what's going on. I think my, the the panelists would kind of share that that sentiment uh, to some extent. Um, so the first thing we'll do we'll we'll, we'll give people a chance to introduce themselves. And then I'm going to do a few introductory slides on software licensing, which is kind of the stuff that I've been able to distill that we agree on is, is kind of true. And then uh, it's a presenter-led panel. So the, the, there are questions that I'll put up on the slides. The panel have seen, sort of seen those in advance. So I'll give everyone a chance, if they want to, uh, to, to answer those questions uh, and contribute to the discussion. So I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Bob. I'm a senior research software engineer at the University of Sheffield. Uh, a lot of what I do is sort of line management of, of RSEs, setting up new projects, interacting with lots of academics across the university and I often get asked questions about software licensing so I've set out to kind of try and learn uh, more about it and, and for me this is kind of part of that exercise of, of learning and, and sharing knowledge. Um, so I'll hand the mic down uh, from, from this end and, and let people introduce themselves. Thanks Bob. Hi everybody, I'm Matt Machin and I co the digital health software team based at the University of Manchester. Um, my team develops smartphone apps, um, web-based interfaces and some server software for a range of health research projects. Um, and I guess I wouldn't say I'm an expert in software licensing, but certainly it's something we've had to think about because we have on occasions rolled our software out into the NHS or other healthcare organisations. Hello, my name is Linus Kasser. I'm working at the EPFL in Switzerland uh, at the Center for Digital Trust. So we work on all kinds of projects that have to do with digital trust. And then the question is always what kind of licenses do we use? Because on one hand, people, they want to create a startup and they want to have some, some patent technologies. And on the other hand, we would like the software to be free so that everybody can use it and that uh, it can be out there for, the, for most of people. So that's always a bit of tension. And then how to tell the professors, no, now you should choose this other license. Uh, hi, I'm Simon Lee. I'm a senior infrastructure engineer at the Health Informatics Center at the University, University of Dundee. Um, I'm currently working, spending much of my time working in open an open source trusted research environment. And I've been working in open source about 10 years, so I was an active GPTUB contributor. And prior to that, I was working for the open microscopy environment. Okay, hi, I'm Heather Turner. I'm based in the statistics department at the University of Warwick. Uh, my experience with licensing um, sort of comes through being uh, an R package author and contributor. Um, I've been a member of the R community for a long time, so I've sort of been party to various discussions about licensing, uh, you know, again, as, a, as an amateur, um, but uh, also sometimes a bit more formally as part, um, I'm on the board of the R Foundation. Uh, I also worked for a long time as an independent consultant, providing statistical programming services. So I have a bit of ex um, experience in that context as well, sort of dealing with companies uh, and that side of things. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dan Katz from the University of Illinois. Um, I've been working on research software for, I don't know, 30 years roughly, and have had experiences with licensing at uh, three different universities, two national laboratories, and then a funding agency. Um, and most of those experiences have led kind of to the same practices across those institutions. Um, and so this may just be commonalities within the U.S. or it may be commonalities within research software engineering in general, and I guess we'll see. Thank you, everyone, for, the, for, for introducing yourselves. Uh, so the next thing I'll do is I'll just do a few slides uh, to uh, explain some, some aspects of, of licensing and copyright um, to sort of 
have everybody on the, the same page and then we'll get into the questions. Um, I'll continue to sit down while I'm doing that so I don't loom over anyone. I, I tend to do that. Um, so we start with copyright. Um, so I, <laughs> my expert, without sort of uh, um, questioning my own expertise, I did have to check this definition and be corrected. Um, so it's a, copyright is uh, essentially about being able to control um, what is done with something that, that, that has been created, some work that has been created. So it's a right to, to kind of control uh, what, what happens uh, with that entity, be it writing or music or, or software or, or, or data. Um, and the way copyright works is it's, it's like, it's almost kind of intrinsic. It's uh, something that is immediately bestowed just by the act of creation of, uh, of, the, of, of the work, of the software, of the music or whatever. The, 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 the convention is, the agreement is that it's, it, it's kind of uh, intrinsic. You don't have to register copyright or do anything. You just, it just uh, appears, it just happens. Um, so th this, this begets a question that I'm sometimes asked, which is sort of who owns the copyright uh, on, on, on my code, on the code that I write while I'm, uh, while, while, while I'm at work. And if you're a researcher, uh, it, it, certainly in the UK, it's probably not you. Um, so if you're university staff, we can look into UK and US law and there's kind of a fundamental, well, there's a sort of legal provision that says your employer, if you produce some code as part of your work, your em employer holds the, the copyright uh, on that code. Um, and that's also often explicitly stated in sort of university regulations and, and contracts and such like. It's a bit of a surprise to, to, to some. Um, if you're a research student, you're, you're not employed, so you're in a slightly different um, relationship with uh, uh, your, your, the university. Um, uh, but, but often there is some provision there that in, in what you've agreed to when you agree to be a student that says the, the university holds your, your IP. This, this can vary quite a lot. Um, undergraduate students, there can be different rules again. Um, and then this is further, comp so I've, I've present, put forward these great general things so everyone knows where they stand. But actually, um, certainly in, in my organization at the University of Sheffield, uh, any research project can really have a specific agreement on IP, which uh, uh, can be quite, uh, quite project specific. So licenses, what, what, is, a, what is a license? Um, so I'll just uh, sort of read this out uh, so for fear of tripping up. So it gives right to use copyright material in specific ways without changing the, or without necessarily changing the, the ownership. And um, one of the important points here is if you're putting code online um, on GitHub, for example, if there's no uh, license, you're not giving anyone uh, the right to copy that code or to use it or do anything with it. So it's really important to, if you're going to do that, to include a license. And, okay, so what are we being, uh, certainly in the UK, what are we, what are we being steered towards doing by our, our funders, etc.? cetera? Um, so the uh, UK government is, is saying that they want to uh, incentivize sharing of, of data and recognize software as research outputs, which tends to imply that we're being encouraged to make things uh, open source and, and license them appropriately. Um, and we've got, you know, from, from, from guidance and aspirations towards uh, policy, um, we are being increasingly sort of told that I mean, this, in this case, it's talking about from the, from the, the idea that you're going to publish a paper and then you need to make the underlying. It's not, it's not putting software where perhaps I feel it should be. But what it is doing is saying, yeah, you know, make, make, your, make your software available, which again pushes us towards uh, open source. There are different types of open source license. Um, these can be grouped into um, sort of copyleft type licenses, which will impose sort of more conditions on work that derives from uh, code licensed in that way. Some licenses are, are more permissive. I hope we'll get into a little bit more discussion on this as we move in. I'm, I'm trying to rattle through this quickly so it's not just me talking. Um, Creative Commons licenses uh, not recommended for, uh, for software. Um, 
for, for the various uh, issues kind of listed listed up there. So um, I just one of the things I want to, whenever I'm talking about this, some of these things are things that I just want to share with people. Okay, so that thus ends the uh, the little introductory bit, and we can move on to the uh, the more interesting part, which is get, letting the panel, giving the panel a chance to speak and venture their opinions on things. Um, so the first question uh, that I'd like to to ask, and I'll, I'll send the mic down the far end and, and pass it back down. I think it seems like a good system. Should RSEs advise a default or open source license, so a specific license to to choose by default? Um, and if so, what what should RSEs advise? So I'll take this down to Matt. Thanks, Bob. No pressure there. Then starting off, <laughs> um, I think maybe the first question to ask here is who has the expertise to decide what's the right license? And it might depend on the setup of the project, but does the RSE know enough about how the software might ultimately get used to be able to make a decision on the license. So I'm really interested to hear what the rest of the panel have to say, but my feeling is that it should be the RSC in combination with the rest of the research team who are making a decision about the open source license. Um, which should it be? It depends, and I'll leave it there. <laughs> That sounds like a really good answer, yeah. <laughs> so, of course, I mean, depending on the project, there are different um, goals of the project. So there are, there are some people, at least in our university, who they, they really want to create a community. So they say, we want to have something very restrictive. So GPL, HGPL, where if somebody touches the code, they also have to participate. And then others are more like, oh, the community might come afterwards for the moment. I just want to get my code out there. So they, they take something very permissive, MIT license. And then there are the, the other people who don't want to have any open source license anywhere because they want to have their patent and they want to do a startup afterwards. And so then they will say, no, we just take a property or license. And I think these are the... Yeah, most difficult to deal with from my point of view because then if you really want to have the project ongoing and you have this property license, you cannot give it out to anybody else. So I'm really trying to convince these people to at least consider one of the other licenses, but it's sometimes hard. Okay, so I think um, if someone comes to you as an RSE and asks for advice on the license, I think you should be in a position to give them some advice. But generally, if someone's coming to you, chances are it's because they don't know. And if you don't answer them, they'll probably just say, well, we won't bother with the license then, which is probably the worst ca case. Um, and ideally, that decision on the license should come from higher up, either at the university level or maybe the funding body. So, for example, I think HDR UK advised an Apache-style license. Um, my, my, my personal preference is to go as sort of free as possible, like MIT or Apache or BSD. But I think ultimately, as I say, you need to probably, well, have your preferred license, understand some of the alternatives, and they understand what the differences are and ultimately explain to whoever's come to you what the differences are and why you think so one's better than the other. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I think it's useful to have a sort of set of go-to licenses, if you like, that you're sort of ready to be able to talk about and, and recommend. Um, I, I think uh, another key thing um, that's mentioned in, in the Choose a License website that I think Bob had on, on the slides, is to con consider the norms of your community. Um, so obviously this, this won't always apply. You know, if you're creating a piece of software that's very standalone, then you, you're kind of on your own. But uh, often researchers are contributing to a, a wider ecosystem, you know, like, like creating an R package or a Python package or something, and then it's good to see what everybody else is doing. So in R, um, GPL is by far the most common license. So if you're really unsure, that's, that's probably, you know, a, a good bet. Uh, it's, so it's about 75% R packages are GPL licensed, about 20% MIT. So you can see it doesn't leave very much, you know. So if you're familiar with those two, you're, you're off to a good start. The bioconductor community is slightly different. Um, they have about 20% artistic license, and that's because that's the license that's used by the core team. So they're sort of setting a lead there. So you can sort of look at uh, the leaders in your community and, and see what they're doing to give a good starting point and find out a bit more about those licenses. 
I guess I'm mostly going to uh, follow Mark's comment, um, which is that this it should be a discussion that the team makes at the beginning of the project, ideally, um, at the same time that they're also talking about how different people are going to get credit on publications and uh, how, how they're going to communicate and how they're going to meet and all of these things. Um, so I think in a, a well-run project, all of this should get done kind of before the actual work starts or maybe in the proposal, if, if not. Um, I guess the only other thing I would say is that uh, I think, as uh, as was said, the the worst thing is not to have any license, and then the next worst thing is to make up your own license. And so, um, so so picking picking one that other people use, um, I think, is is certainly a good thing to do. Wonderful. Thanks for all of those answers. Um, so I'll move on to I'll move on to the next question. Um, and yeah, this is. Uh, I don't know whether this will prove to be an odd one. Really interested to see what the response to this. So should the organizations we work for or study at grant us ownership of the code that we produce to license as we choose? This might be quite quick or quite slow to answer. I'm not sure. I'll, uh, I'll go with Matt once again. Thanks, Bob. So I'm going to give my answer very clearly in one camp here. Um, as Bob kind of explained in the, the intro, if you're a staff member at a university, you, it's pretty much for certain that the university owns the copyright to what you produce. They pay you as your employer um, and they for, therefore own what you create. So um, it seems like a pretty massive step for an organisation to turn around and say, actually, we don't own that anymore, I'm going to let you own it and you can choose how to licence it. So I, I can't see how that could work in practice, certainly in a, in a large university type institution. Yeah, I think it also depends on what kind of code you're talking. So, I mean, if it's code that is specifically related to a project, then as, uh, as you said before, this should be discussed beforehand. But then if it's code that overhangs multiple projects and you would like to to share it with uh, other people of the community, then I think it would be very nice if the if the RSCs or the, the group of the RSCs, if they have a say within the university and can say, hey, we, we think it would be really nice to open source this package and it would be really nice to, to be able to share it with other people and uh, then so also, yeah, have, have some say in that, that part. Uh, so I can maybe sit on the fence a bit. So I'm a very big proponent of open science and open source, and I think as a research community, we should be encouraging people to basically follow, follow those principles. And I think the danger is if you, give, if you let everyone have like, a say on what, how things are licensed, I suspect a lot of people default to saying, now we're going to keep it private or proprietary because they're not really familiar with the fields. But I think it also perhaps comes down to what the default university license is going to be and what your personal preferences are. Because like, I'm in favour, say, MIT BSD style. If that was a default at your institution, then because that more or less lets anyone do anything with it to a certain extent, I think that would be fine, for example. But if you're much more on the GPL side, then potentially that's more restrictive. So we seem to be arranged <coughs> quite well because I, I'm coming from a, a bit further across uh, in uh, coming much more from a researcher point of view and thinking that if you're developing software or collaborating with RSCs to develop software that's essentially implementing your novel methodology, then it's, it's your methods written in another format. And so I see that as a, a scholarly work. And uh, often in, in, the, in the university sort of regulations, they will distinguish between a sort of creative work and a scholarly work. So your scholarly work is obviously things like papers and so on, and, and researchers keep the right to that, but somehow I think software is a bit lagging behind because it's always in the creative part by default um, and therefore the university keeps, you know, I'm, I'm not disagreeing that the university has copyright by default. But I think some universities are, are starting, um, you know, to sort of allow a bit more discretion and that and they have actually sort of codified that. So I, I did look a bit at what other universities are doing and I noticed the... Uh, uh, you know, at, at uh, I think at Oxford, for example, they they do sort of explicitly say that that researchers uh, are given um, a dis discretion to to license their code as long as it's not prejudic prejudicing, um, you know, the the ability to exploit um, commercially. If, if you know, so that is a you still have to consider that, and they you know do say that you have to consider third party. Uh, 
interests, you know, or terms such as your funders, and and of course get consent from other authors. So it's it's not it's not uh, you know just simply granting people the permission to do what they like, but there's still that sort of uh, principle there that it, it is seen as a scholarly work and um, and uh, and and they want and I think also Reading has something similar where they say oh we, you know. Um, we want people to disseminate their research and therefore we encourage people to um, release their code under an open source license. Um, so I'm a little bit more <laughs> in that camp. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think I agree with that, that I, I would like to actually see software um, considered similar to papers that are produced in universities. Um, but on, on the other hand, I think from the practical point of view, I actually don't necessarily most of the time care about copyright. I do care about licensing. Um, so I, I don't feel like I need to own the code. I feel like the university owning the code is fine as long as I can have input and ideally make a decision about licensing. Um, and the, the way that I guess that I've usually done this is by writing in the license into the grant proposal so that when the university gets the money, they've already agreed to the license. Um, and that seems like it's successful. The, the one thing I would say, um, going back to I guess Linus's point, is that um, if the if I'm making a contribution to third-party code, then we get into this weird situation where, in theory, the university has copyright over the contribution I've made. But but I really don't want that third-party code to then be kind of partially owned by my university. I'd actually like to transfer the copyright to them directly, if, particularly if it's a, a patch to something or something like that. And that's that's something that we don't seem to really understand how to do at all legally. We just kind of do it under the covers and pretend it didn't happen. Yeah, well, I, was, I was just going to say that uh, part of having the copyright means that you have you have the right to decide on the on the license. So that, you know, I think that sort of get, does go hand in hand, even though we like to think about them differently, uh, and maybe in practice they're, they're handled a bit differently. But I think, yeah, it's getting down the legal <laughs> the legal side. Yeah, this is possibly not a perfectly worded question with me using ownership in in that way. Don't know, um, but thank you very much, everyone, for the for the for the. The, the answers there. Um, okay, so uh, on to the next one. How can we make good decisions on whether code should be made should remain closed source for commercial reasons? Without wishing Bob to unsettle your plan, <laughs> how about varying the order here? <laughs> okay, might, um, might be interesting. Let's let's go from the middle then. Shall we? Okay, okay sorry. sure, that's fine. Um, so I think most people, when they think of like say, commercializing their research, they may just think, oh, whether it's going to it's going to change the world, we're going to be like billionaires or whatever. Uh, so I think one fact to be aware of is that firstly, you're effectively setting up a startup, and most startups unfortunately fail. Uh, I think the second fact is that actually, just because you you make your code open source, doesn't mean you can't commercialize it. So there's a lot of examples of companies that have you no. Know, have open source software and built successful businesses around it. Uh, unfortunately, there's also those examples like say, Elasticsearch and maybe MongoDB, who've actually switched to more restrictive licenses because they felt other companies would take advantage of the code. Um, but the third fact is that another sort of um, get start cliche is that ideas are cheap, execution, execution is key. So you might have the best code in the world, the best research product, the best ideas, but actually building, commercializing it's a lot more work. You've got sales, you've got marketing, you've got product development, you've got build a community. So yeah, I think, I think those are some of the factors you should, really, should, should take into account and maybe don't. And I, think, yeah, I think it's great to try and make a commercially successful product, but don't just think it's going to be really easy. You choose, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want? Yeah, I don't have too much to say on this. I mean, uh, decision, the decision might come near the beginning of the project, of course. You know, if you're working with commercial partners to start with, you know, that, that might be part of the idea that you, you, you're producing some software that's, that's they're going to uh, exploit commercially. Um, I, think, I think otherwise, uh, you know, dual licensing is, is a possibility. So you can, you know, m make sure that you have a community version that the research community can use. And, uh, but um, keep open that option to have, you know, perhaps a, a you know, a commercial version that with a, a slicker front end and uh, better support or whatever that, that will be more attractive to companies. I, I, I guess for me, I think that um, probably nobody that's at a university went there because they were trying to make a lot of money. 
Um, at least, at least it seems like that when I look at the RSE survey. Um, but uh, so I guess the question is kind of what, what's the reason that we would do this? And and so I think probably most people want their code to be used as one thing. And so um, does making it commercial make it more likely to be used? Uh, in some cases, yes. In most cases, probably no. Um, and then the other piece is that I think people want their code to actually be sustained and to stay around for a long time. And so then that actually maybe is a trickier question because um, in a lot of cases, if you can build a community around the code, it seems like you can be successful in sustaining the code through a community model. Um, but there also are areas in which that doesn't seem to work and the, and the way that codes get sustained is through a commercial route. Um, so it, I, I think it kind of has to be decided based on the, the particular context of the code, but, uh, um, but maybe at least thinking of that context of, of what's going to lead to the most use, what's going to lead to the most sustainability would be ways of, of thinking about this decision. Final word or I'll go. Yeah, so I think building on the previous answers, it's very context dependent as to whether you want to keep it closed source or not. I think it depends whether you're sharing the code that other people will then build on, um, or you're creating do I want to say product, something that actually is going to get used by by people in a different way. So if I think about the area that we work in, so we work in health software and the value in what we produce comes not from sharing the code, but from creating something that maybe gets rolled out into the NHS or the health systems and gets used by people. And it's really, really hard to do that um, without the backing of a, an organization and probably a reasonable sized organization to do it. So open sourcing your software probably is not going to get you as far down that path of sharing, being able to get the software used in the NHS or the similar organizations, um, because you're going to need a, an organization to drive it, and the organization might be less incentivized if it's an open source um, product. So I think, there are, it, it, as the other panel members have said, it's very context dependent, but there are certain situations where keeping it closed source might actually be the best way to get the altruistic value of you know improving people's health by, by sharing it as a product. Yeah, so also the, the couple of startups that I saw emerging from EPFL, they're definitely the, the, the VCs, the people who wanted to invest in the startups that were less akin to invest if it was open source license because I said, well, if you have a concurrent, it will, he will just uh, take the code and just do his own stuff. Which is not correct neither, because I mean you do need the know-how of the of the group. You cannot just take a code and run away and, and, and do your own thing. That doesn't really work. So how we ended up doing this at DPFL is having uh, dual licenses, uh, which means that the code per se is licensed, for example, GPL, HGPL, but then there is a dual license and say, well, the, um, the owner of the code, which is the lab in our case, not the university, the owner of the code can decide to change the license. Now, this also means that everybody who is working on the code has to sign a, 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 an additional uh, contributor's license agreement to say, every contribution I give, I give the copyright itself to the owner of the code, which is the lab, which complicates participation a bit, but most of the people who want to participate, they don't see a problem in signing this computer contributor license agreement. So for the moment, this works quite well. Dual licensing, for me, it's a bit the best of both worlds. While, while the thing is in, in, in development, I mean, you can create a community and if all of a sudden you have somebody wanting to invest, you can say, okay, now we take the code, the, the open source code will still stay there, this will not disappear, but now the, the further um, development of this code will go uh, without open source license. I think that's kind of a, a good compromise from my point of view. Uh, if anyone would like to add anything, uh, they're welcome to do so. Okay, well, I guess, uh, so I would just say I'm, I'm a little bit uh, maybe uncertain of the dual licensing term that you're using because the way that I understand dual licensing is that it, you have two different licenses for the same code depending on the purpose, not that you have one and then you switch to another. So. Okay, yeah, so it's... Um, yeah, true. So here the dual licensing is to say, well, the, the 
all the code that is available is under GPL, but all the copyright resides with the lab. And so because the copyright resides with the lab, the lab is at any moment allowed to change the license of the code. And saying from now on the code is licensed as a commercial license to this specific uh, company. And now this specific company can use the code under a commercial license. They can change the code without having to, to give back the changes as the GPL or the AGPL uh, mandates. It's from that point of view where it's dual license because you have the open source license available, but for another company you create um, a, a commercial license. Does that make sense? I, f I guess uh, I don't think we're going to answer this in this in this panel very quickly. So maybe we'll just leave it. I'm I'm a little bit confused still. Okay. Um, so. Okay. Thank, thanks again, everybody. Um, okay. So so this question. Um, uh, this this is this is inspired by the fact that some research funders are starting to do this. Um, a little bit. So is it a good idea for research funders to advise or stipulate a particular license? Would you like to start off? Sure. Uh, no. <laughs> um, no, sorry. Uh, so, but, uh, but I don't, I, I feel like the answer is it directly is no, but, uh, but the funder certainly can have uh, goals that they want and then you should be able to, to choose a license that, that meets those goals and do it through a peer review process just like you do everything else. So say, say what you're going to do. The funder agrees that that's the best way to meet their goals, and they and they support it. Yeah. Okay. So, so I agree that they shouldn't stipulate a, a particular license, but I think it it is good that they they advise uh, to have an open source license because I think that is um, uh, consistent with with the open research uh, um, principles that that Bob was sharing before, and I, I think at the moment. Um, I think the UK is lagging behind a bit. Other countries, um, you know, I th they, they've um, put more effort behind um, open research, open access, open data. Uh, so I hope open research will be next because, uh, yeah, certainly I think um, things like NIH in the US and uh, um, funders in France, for example, it, it sort of an open source license is is prioritised. You know, it's, it's still not. Um, insisted on, I don't think, but that it's definitely, you know, strongly advised and 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 uh, prioritised. And I, I would like to see that um, in the UK because I think, uh, yeah, our research would be the public goods and for the good of the research community. Um, and I think that you know they could have basic standards like uh, a license that's approved by by the Open Source Initiative or, or something like that. Yep, um, I agree with Heather. I mean, basically, most research, well, research from with, with the uh, sorry. Funding from the Research Council is basically ultimately public money. They already mandate open, ac so open access and open data. I think like, requiring an open source license is a natural extension. Uh, I'd probably say, it's, I'd probably, I think I'd probably like to see them basically strongly recommend a license, and then you have to specifically ask for an exclusion, just but it saves, it makes it a bit easier. Yeah, I agree with everything that you said. If if they advise an open source license, of course they should advise it. But if they advise a closed source license or if they even advise NDAs, then it gets more difficult. So if you have somebody coming to you and say, OK, I want to fund this research, but you need first to sign an NDA and all the code will be under a closed source license and only we are allowed to have the code, then I think it gets very difficult. But that's just me. So I largely agree with what the other panel members have said. I think a strong recommendation from a funder is fine as long as you've got a route for exclusion if you've got particular circumstances that require it. I think as long as it's an open source recommendation. Um, if it's a fairly permissive open source license and that doesn't stop you further down the line, uh, maybe building on that piece of software with a more clo closed license if you want to take it in the commercial route later. So I think. I think it can work, having the funder make some recommend strong recommendations. Aha, I'm going one way, the microphone's going the other way. It's very <laughs> exciting. Thanks for all of those. Um, and uh, OK, so, so this, is, uh, this is a complicated thing to, to ask, to my mind anyway. Um, 
So how do we ensure that copyright and licensing are correctly managed for projects? And we, we've had some allusions to this, I think, already. How do we ensure that copyright and licensing are correctly managed for projects where people from multiple organisations contribute? Who would like to, to start off on that? If not, I'm going to go down to Matt again, I think. Yeah, as Bob suggested, this is a complex issue. Um, I think the most important thing is to discuss this really early um, and start to get some agreements in place and potentially, you know, if it's a grant application involving multiple organisations, maybe you want to be having some kind of preliminary IP agreement um, before you've even submitted the grant application so there's no nasty surprises later. Um, and as part of that agreement, you can have a setup where, you know, one organisation owns the, the software, the IP, but others are licensed to use it for, let's say, research or teaching purposes, but they can't commercialise it, or there may be some other setup. But you can, it can get very complicated. But um, I think getting some sort of proper agreement in place is the way to do it, and um, making sure you have that discussion early before you don't go and create the code and then try and have the fight later, because that's going to be a lot harder. Yeah, sorry, folks, difficult to get a disagreement here. I think we're all more or less on the same <laughs> road. So, yeah, just as I said before, one um, another element could be this contributor license agreement. So saying, OK, all the code will be under this entity and everybody needs to sign a paper that says that all the code that they give is under this entity and this entity will license it. That would then just be part of this this agreement in the beginning. Yeah, well, I agree with all that. Uh, basically, like, for example, if you create a GitHub repo by default, GitHub will recommend that you at least create a license file as the first thing. And I think that's probably the most important thing to create in your repo, just because it stays. Just because then once it's there, everyone knows what the situation is. And I think also think I'd agree with the idea of maybe um, assigning copyright to an owner if you want, just because it gives the project a bit more freedom in the future to relicense. So, for example, if you look at something like the Linux kernel, it's GPL2. It's going to be GPL2 forever because they can't contact all thousands or tens of thousands of developers to ask if they can change it. Yeah, I think we've basically answered this question, but um, maybe just to add something else to think about at the same time, uh, it goes back to what Dan was saying about, about the sustainability and uh, so if you're assigning all the sort of responsibility to one organization you know is that going to be best for sustainability and in, in terms of you know are they going to take responsibility for ensuring that the software is maintained it's, it's not exactly the same issue but it could be something to think about at the same time while you're having these discussions at the beginning hopefully of your project yeah i, I was thinking about this uh this quote about uh faculty meetings in universities where it's uh everybody argues so much because there's not really much they can do um, and I feel like this is actually kind of we're in the opposite situation a bit, or at least I have been in the opposite situation a bit, where um, we work together because that's kind of the way we work, and there's no big, I don't know, nobody's making a lot of money, so nobody really cares a huge amount about this, right? We Our, our goals are not uh, to, to, to come up with a license. We find a license that everybody thinks is, eh, okay, I can live with that one, that's fine. And, and we don't necessarily really worry about copyright. We say, well, our institutions hold copyright and other people come in and they contribute as well. And that's fine. We're all kind of trying to do the same thing. So so in some sense, we actually kind of ensure these things by not caring so much. Um, and that seems to work okay, at least in a lot of scientific projects. Yep, I'll just pass this down, some uh, reaction here. Thanks. Just picking up on, on what Heather said, actually. Um, also thinking about which organization is best placed to do something useful with this at the end of it. So, you know, if you've got a consortium of different organizations, it might be that one has particular specialist expertise and is able to think about making, rolling this out into, into more widespread use. Um, and as long as all of the other organizations agree, it might be best to pick that organization because you're ultimately then maximizing the benefit that you get from what is essentially public money by take, giving it to the organization that, that's got the, the know-how and expertise to, to take it further. If anyone else would like to comment again, then they're welcome to do so. Um, yeah, so I guess one fact you might want to think about is that, say, a lot of open source projects now, end up, as, as you said, are assigned to, say, foundations like the Apache Foundation, for example, or the Cloud Native Something Foundation. So that's, yeah, that's another thing to consider. 
And I guess also whether you need to sort of assign copyright will also come down to a license. Uh, so I'm not a lawyer, but as far as I know, if, say if the code is Apache license, I think it's perfectly fine to relicense the GPL or to make a commercial or take a commercial or something without getting anyone's permission. Whereas if it's GPL, you would need to get the agreement of every of every owner unless it's been assigned. I, I feel like we need to actually get somebody legal in here because I don't. I, I kind of disagree with that. I, I don't think technically you can take something that's Apache licensed and just change it without having everybody that contributed agree. But that's again, I I don't know the law officially. So thanks. So uh, yeah, we we're not as as we said at the start, we're we're sort of talking from a, a yeah, sort of non-legal perspective. Sorry, oh, please. I just feel a little disagreement, so I try to jump. But <laughs> but most probably for something like MIT, that should work because MIT says, well, you do with the code whatever you want. So if I say, okay, what I want to do with the code is to put it under a GPL license, and then of course a contributor is is free to say, oh, I participate under the Linus GPL uh, licensed code, or I participate under the MIT from from Bob. Um, then the contributor can decide under which one he wants. To contribute. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not a lawyer neither, but uh, yeah. Okay, I take back what I said about Apache. Uh, Steve, Steve MIT or BSD, because I think they are pretty free. Yeah. Okay. I, so, I, uh, again, um, even though it's dangerous to say anything, uh, <laughs> I, I kind of still disagree because I, I feel like um, I think even as a contributor under MIT or BSD, I can say uh, I don't, uh, well, I feel like I'd want to be able to say I don't agree with that decision and I'd like you to stop using my code and, and so then I don't quite know what path we go down. So I, yeah, we need a lawyer, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it would be a bad idea to actually get to a, I, I, I'll, 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 at, the, at the end I'll give people we have, we have two lawyers in the back. I think. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I mean, um, if, if you're really keen to, to, to jump in on, on, on this then. I have some practical experience. So sure, please. please. So we relicensed the Taverna workflow software from GPL to Apache 2 to move it into Apache as an Apache project. It was a, it was a condition of it going into Apache and have no GPL uh, dependencies or anything like that. Um, and yeah, we had to ask everyone who'd ever contributed to the code to do that and at the same time put in the um, moving forward put in a contributor agreement so that we didn't have to do it ever again if we wanted to do something like that um, so it's, that was just a, an anecdote of, of um, you know, yeah but it is from things. restricted to unrestricted oh, yeah. so how would it go the other way <coughs> well we got plenty of example of a code which were in MIT and, and were fault to, to GPN so okay. Without, without any agreement for the contribution. So let's assume that you don't consider GPL to be massively restricted. No, but it is an argument that with MIT you can do anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's get the, this last contribution on this. Yeah, I mean, it's it, this also refers back to the previous question about about whether people uh, whether funders should be encouraged to to provide licenses or indeed allowed. Um, uh, because we were involved in a project um, w developing some code that was already in a variety of mixed uh, uh, licenses, some GPL, some BSD, um, and, and the funder tried to insist that all of the software would either be MIT or BSD licensed, um, and it was pretty clear that the reason for that was because they wanted to close it immediately afterwards um, and, then, and then sell it to a commercial uh, uh, organization and so they they were they themselves were certain and this is a U, uh, UKRI they were they were convinced that the, the this um, that they could uh, immediately close a BSD license stuff and and sell it so um, or, or get a commercial developer to produce it as a commercial product and and I think as a result of that experience where we had to push back quite hard to get them to basically point out that we'd have to relicense the code and find all of the authors um, uh, I'm very anti um, uh, funders uh, determining licenses. Okay, thanks for that. That was a 
got people good and good and excited. Um, I would remind, l love to remind you all of the licensing channel on the in RSE Slack. We can explore some of these things further. And if we do need to go outside the community for advice on legal matters, I, I, I'm sure I can. There's, there are ways of us. Do, there must be ways of us doing this. If there aren't, then we need to, I, I need to find them. Okay. I, I think. Uh, this is the final question, and I think that works quite well r with regards to, to timing, I expect. So how much does the issue of licensing cause useful code to languish on researchers and RSE's laptops compared with other barriers? Who would like to start us off? Linus. I will just say the thing that nobody really wants to hear. Um, I think, unfortunately, not much. Um, having tried to get community around co code for different projects, I think it's very difficult, even with good licensing, even if with a good pro uh, project, really getting a community is difficult. So I think, sorry guys, just because you will open source it will not make people love your code. But that's my take. Yeah, so I think in the area where I work, this probably doesn't really happen. So the code that we develop doesn't languish somewhere because we're generally developing something for a very specific purpose for a given project. Um, so I would say I haven't really seen this, but I agree with Linus's comment that just because you open source something doesn't mean the community is going to pop up. And if you want to create an open source community, you actually need to invest quite a lot of time and effort in making that happen. Um, just because you, you know your your code being there isn't going to re result in tens of developers turning up and starting to contribute to in day one. You've got to make a lot of effort to build that community and get people actively engaged. Yep. So again, I don't think I don't think licensing is what's stopping people from say releasing this their source code or anything. I think it's more day to day things like people haven't got time, people are worried about the quality of the code and don't want to sh and don't want to make it public, or you know, just haven't thought about it. And I think. I think if we're at the stage where the, un where the only barrier to someone like releasing the code is licensing, I'd say we're in a pretty good position. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that there's, I mean, you mentioned several reasons, and um, yeah, I think uh, just just the challenge of of, of getting a uh, software publication ready, or what people perceive that the, the, you know the effort to be in 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 that and writing the documentation, writing uh, tests or, or whatever, uh, passing whatever checks that are set. If if you're contributing to a larger ecosystem, you know again like like, like our, um, you know there's these additional steps and, and effort that that people have to make, um, you know to to to, to get their code from. Uh, yeah, fr from their laptops, as you were saying, to 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 a published version, and I think all the other stuff is <laughs> much much of a bigger uh, a bigger barrier than uh, than how to license it. Although uh, I'm sure most researchers would be quite unsure where to start with licensing. Yeah, I don't think I can add anything beyond what's been said. I agree with almost everything. So. Okay, well, we're, we're running close to the end of time, um, which is fine, because that was the last question, so that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, would any of the panel like to make any sort of closing remarks, anything that I've, I've missed that people were desperate to say while they're here? Uh, Linus? I have this one question where I would also like to know, perhaps we can get some disagreement there. Um, uh, uh, let's say if you have something that is um, paid by public funding, should the license also be uh, an open source license? Or would it be okay for a publicly funded project to be it on a commercial license, to be commercialized? Because after all, once it's commercialized, the state also gets a return on investment, which would also be okay. So publicly funded projects, open source or not? Okay, uh, so very briefly, I would say yes, but for different reasons, um, and we could go into that separately. But I was going to say the thing um, that that I wanted just to add is that uh, I recently found out that 2023 is going to be the year of open science in the U.S., and all agencies are going to be uh, creating open science initiatives like NASA has done with the TOPS initiative recently. Um, and so the thing that I'm actually kind of looking forward to seeing is how software fits into this, because I don't think that the discussions have really gotten down to a level of what does this mean yet um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, that that the research community will be kind of pushing and saying 
be sure that you include software as you're having this discussion, but I don't know. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so, um, all that remains is for me to to thank all of you once again for coming. Thank the conference uh, organisers, and especially to uh, thank the panel for their brilliant answers to all of the questions. So, thank you very much. Uh, top question is, where do I put copyright? What about when I fork use someone else's? Most resources tell us how to pick license and use, but not copyright. Does anyone have any links? So does anyone have any thoughts on that? There is a thought over here. What we uh, usually do with uh, copyright notices is put them in every single source code file. And there is a, re uh, a thing called the reuse specification who gives you a good format uh, of doing that, just to make sure that everything's copyrighted. Cool, thank you. What's the distinction between intellectual property and copyright with respect to ownership and permissions in a research software context? Does anyone have any thoughts, definitions on this they want to share? Definitely not a lawyer. but I, I, So I have looked into this in terms of relicensing. Lots of people have said, obviously, you have to go back and ask the original authors. So my understanding of it is, obviously, intellectual property is it's your property. Copyright is a mechanism which is automatic. I don't even think you need to explicitly state copyright. It's automatically kind of inferred that if you've written it, it's your legal pr protection over the thing that you own. And a license is literally just that. It's just something that you grant to allow people to use or redistribute a piece of code. So the reason why you can't just redistribute something that's under MIT, which is obviously very permissive, under something else is because you don't own it. The people that have written it have owned it. Um, so that's why you need to go back and, and ask for their permission uh, to relicense their intellectual property. In the United States, there's additional distinction between the copyright and the patents, because in the United States, the patents for software exist. In Europe, it's a complicated issue. But in principle, IP uh, includes also the patents. Yeah, I was going to say, um, Neil Chu Hong, I have some slides that explain the relationship between intellectual property, copyright, and licensing, which are open, openly licensed, so perhaps that might be useful for some people. Um, kind, of go, kind of going back though to, to a thing, I am not a lawyer, but I do teach software licensing. Um, so things like the MIT license uh, and going on to, to sub-licensing and re-licensing. So explicitly, a lot of the permissive licenses allow re-licensing, which allows someone to take it and apply other conditions, which are more restrictive, as long as they don't break the conditions that are in the license. But that license allows you to re-license. So what people are saying about going from Apache to, B, uh, to GPL is allowed because the two are compatible. Um, so it's kind of a bit weird. And this is why we employ a lot of lawyers in the world, unfortunately. So, yeah. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more question. So, uh, regarding the ownership of code, many universities waive intellectual property for research outputs. Um, the question is then a code, oh, the question is then, is the code a research output? So I think this was kind of discussed during, we already discussed that. The question is then, should code be classed as a research output? Oh, should code be classed as a research output? Yeah, so I think that w the panel would discuss that, so uh, let's move on. As an ontologist, licensing is hard. We tend to use CC0 or CC BY, and it can be mandated by our projects too. Ontologies have associated code, so should we mix licenses? This is a question I had as well, is like when you have multiple different types of data in a repository that might benefit from different licenses, how, do, how does that, how, what's best practice in that? There is a hand at the back. So I'm not a lawyer, um, but my understanding is you can't use the CC set of licenses for code and you can't go the other way. Dan's going to just tell you I'm wrong here, but I think that, um, so if you've got different things, you should license them with different things legally, I think. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I, I guess the question then is though, if they're, if they're all in the same repository, What's best practice for that? So I, I think there's kind of two best practices that seem to be evolving. So one is to have each thing in a different repository and have those repositories linked. So then you have a separate license for each thing. So you have a data repository, you have an ontology repository, and so on. The other one is um, increasingly there's the use of a licenses directory, 
which simply states all of the licenses for all of the different things. So you would you would have a collection of licenses because even for software, uh, larger software projects, you may have different parts that have different licenses. Um, and I think that kind of like the clear thing is just be really clear in all of your documentation how you're licensing it because otherwise people will get it wrong when they try and reuse it. Did you want to comment at all? Yes, this was uh, my question because I spend a lot of my time with the Oboe Foundry, which is a life science uh, ontology community, and they mandate either CC0 or CC BY, and they also give you a development kit so that you can build a GitHub repository that will do all the releases for you and build various versions and implementations of your ontology for you. And so at the moment, all of that is wrapped up under the one license that the Oboe Foundry recommends, well, one of two licenses. And so the question then I have, some repos that simply have CC by or some variant thereof. And I just, I know that we're talking about creative works in terms of ontologies, but we're also talking about software because there's all of the code required to build them. And it's starting to get quite complex. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's a question I've ignored, essentially. Uh, and so now I thought it might be a good place to not ignore it. But I like, I like your answer because I think that gives us a couple of options. Yeah, thanks. So as much as that discussion seems to be going really well, we are now out of time. But thankfully, we are at the coffee break, so it's the perfect time to continue that discussion <laughs> over coffee. So let, all that remains is to thank Stefan, to thank Bob, thank all of the panellists again for a really great session. Thank you.